I just got back from Israel on Tuesday. Yeah. Awesome, awesome trip. So many things running around in my mind. I don't even know where to start. <laughs> okay, okay, but okay. The major one is okay. So I went there and I was taught by these three like Messianic Jews. Okay. who uh, they all got saved like back in the 70s, you know, Jesus movement. They've wow. been ministering together for 44 years. Like, it's it's crazy what has been, you know. But the way they read scripture was very different from me, mm. mm -hmm. okay? So I was taught like, okay, take these three verses, tear them apart, you know, <laughs> da, 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 you know, and so, uh, you know, make a sermon out of it. So I've got that. But what they really did was just... It was a lot of just walking through the entire Bible. Mm -hmm. And to them, they don't like that there's Old Testament, New Testament. It's just the story of God, mm -hmm. you know, who came up with this. You know, they said if there's one page of scripture you can rip out, it's the one between the New and Old Testament. You know, like, <laughs> because, yeah. and the way they describe things, there was such a beautiful, beautiful flow yes. to the entire story of God and and even looking at Genesis 1 and how how much it's it 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 fits with Revelation 22 and Genesis 2 fits with Revelation 21 and Genesis 3 fits with Revelation 20 and they're like just look at the 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 beauty the poetry the how God just doesn't leave anything you know like uh you know, sharing with the church yesterday, like I was standing in the Jordan River, you know, while we were in our Bible reading, reading through Joshua and realizing, you know, they're explaining, no, you're in the spot where they say Joshua was. I'm like, really? And, uh, and so Joshua crossing the Red Sea, I mean, crossing the, uh, Jordan. to Jordan, but he probably crossed the Red Sea. He did cross the Red Sea, right? With Some Moses. Point, was yeah. Wasn't he there? Yeah, he was. He had to be there. Yeah, he was alive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so anyway, like, was he alive? There was. No, I was. I was blanking right there for a second. I'm jet lagged. Okay, so, but you know, you have the Ark of the Covenant that goes in the water. I mean, with the priest holding it and toss it, you know, and then they go over on dry land. Reminds them of the Red Sea. I'm like, wow, that's so awesome, you know. And then, you know, every foot where his foot touches, and then. um but then they're going, you know, something else happened in the same spot. This is where Elijah crossed the Red Sea. I mean, the Jordan. I'm like, whoa, this was the same spot? Mm. Like, yeah, based upon the geography of where he was going, where he was headed, this seems like the same spot where he touched the water with the cloak right. and it turns dry and he goes over with Elisha and then he gets taken up to heaven. Elisha comes back with, a, you know, the double portion and the cloak and go, okay, God, are you with me too? And boom. Yes, I'm with you too. And it dries out. I'm like, whoa, I'm in the same spot where that happened. And then you realize this is also what they say is the same spot that John the Baptist was, mm -hmm. where he baptized Jesus. Mm -hmm. And so now it's not just the ark. It's the very presence of Christ himself in that same water. And, and just looking at the history of this and then thinking, wait, John the Baptist came in the spirit of Elijah. Mm -hmm. And and so you're like, whoa, this keeps going on. And and then when when uh, just like he wanted to show that he was with Joshua, he was with Elisha, and now with Jesus, you actually have a voice from heaven yes. and the spirit mm -hmm. himself descending. And it was just so beautiful, mm -hmm. like the continuity mm -hmm. and then realizing, oh, Jesus and Joshua actually had the same name. Right. Yeshua. You know, Yahweh is salvation. And so here he's coming to take the land. And, and so just seeing the beauty of the continuity of Scripture. Um, and I go on and on about that. But the one thing that he brought up that I just want to get your thoughts on it. Um, he was talking about, because it made sense to me but it was new to me. Um, he said, okay, if you look in Revelation, you've got the dragon who, with his tail, takes a third of the stars out of the heaven, and a lot of people interpret that as the devil taking a third of the, the angels, and, and they're being cast to the earth. They're cast out of heaven. Um, and so, so the whole idea is Satan can't take over heaven. Okay, mm -hmm. God is there. 
Um, but the earth, which he's been cast into, you have God who says to, a- to uh, Adam, I'm giving you dominion over everything. And so Satan, his whole point is, I'm going to influence Adam and Eve. You know, so that I can be the God of this world. Mm -hmm. Okay, I can't be the God of heaven. I want to be the God of this world. And so he influences Eve, and sure enough, they're cursed. They're taken out of the garden, and and there's something that's really destroyed there. Mm -hmm. Um, And But he knows, even though Satan is not omniscient, he knows the prophecy that one day the seed of this woman is going to crush your head. And so he does everything he can to influence and change that because he wants to be the God. This is why Jesus calls him the prince of this world. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's why Ephesians says you're following the God, you know, the, the power of the prince of the air, the, the, the course of this world. Um, he's called the God of this world. And, and so the idea is he keeps trying to destroy whatever God is going to do on this earth because he wants to remain the God of this world. And that's why when he knew the seed was going to um, crush him, they have Abel and Cain, and so he gets in Cain's head. Hmm. Kill Abel. You know, it's it's this, and this it's just the story never mm-hmm. ends mm-hmm. where he just keeps trying to influence, and and that's why even at times like when Moses is born, Satan doesn't know who it is, so he's like, I want to kill every single Hebrew baby. You know, it's the same thing that happened at the time of Esther, same thing that happened when the Christ comes. You know, Herod is killing all of the babies. It's just this constant influence. And then he goes in because he knew the seed was coming from there. But now the story continues and he's explaining how this is why you see such a persecution of the Jewish people. It it's there's so much hatred toward the. I mean, to this day, mm. you've got the Ayatollah Khomeini um, who who said in 2015, "I will uproot and destroy all of Israel by 2040." Mm. You know, they have these hourglass, you know, festivals now, just talking about the time is ticking, and we're going to destroy all of the Jews. We're going to obliterate them. And you look at the Holocaust, and you're like, "Gosh, what is it with?" such hatred towards the Jews and, and even the, the destruction of the temple and and in in 130 when uh, the Emperor Hadrian was just like every Jew needs to get out you're no longer allowed here in fact we're no longer gonna call this place Israel you know it, it's just like it's just this constant boom boom we're gonna destroy 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 and I guess I guess when he explained it, and and his fight was, he's like, don't you understand that we are praying for his kingdom to come mm-hmm. and his will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. Too many Gentile believers just think, oh, let's die and go to heaven. Mm-hmm. He goes, that's not the narrative of the scripture. It's about the narrative of Jesus coming back to the earth to take his land and take what is rightfully his Mm -hmm. and setting up his kingdom right here on earth. Mm -hmm. And so that's why to them, the millennium kingdom, millennial kingdom is huge, Mm -hmm. you know, because it's like, no, I am, you know, there's this land there that's set apart right there in Jerusalem where they're going to build a house for the the next uh, leader of Israel or whatever. And, and he's just going, it should be Jesus. You know, mm-hmm. like this is, this is, mm-hmm. this is the perfect storyline that it, when you look at the whole narrative of scripture, because I always wrestled with the millennial, you know, just mm-hmm. going, gosh, is that real? Is it really a thousand year reign? But then he, they brought something up that, and they're not trying to be super prophetic. They're just going, think about this. You know, we have Shabbat dinners because uh, six days we work and then we have that Shabbat where we rest that seventh day. Mm-hmm. And so we have dinner together. We, you know, we don't do any work because we want to remember God created the world in six days and then on the seventh day he rested. When I was driving by, I saw Shabbat fields because they're going, oh, it's the seventh year. Right. So you can't plant on the seventh year. It all just reminds them of this creation story. And... Uh, he says, you know, you got to realize that from Adam to Abraham was 2,000 years. And then from 
Abraham to Jesus was 2,000 years. And now from Jesus to us is 2,000 years. That's 6,000 years. Hmm. Perfect time for a millennial, 1,000-year reign of Christ, for the earth to rest from all of this fighting and warring and for Jesus to take his throne. And I was like, wow, hmm. I have never mm -hmm. thought of that. And I don't naturally think about this war between God and Satan and this constant mm -hmm. thing that's gone on through, but it makes sense to me. Um, I guess my thinking has not been so fluid. I'm just more choppy in my inter So as I throw that out, do you just kind of go, well, duh, Francis, or do you go, uh, I don't know about that? Mm. No, it's <laughs> and I know. I yeah, and, and I and I said to the church, I go, look, when we get yeah. to end time stuff, look, we got to be so careful. Totally. Yeah. And uh, I, I just, but we are supposed to know the season we're in, mm -hmm. and it is crazy that here I am in Jerusalem with Messianic Jews and Palestinian believers, Arab believers, and we're worshiping in Hebrew. In Arabic, mm. in the same room. Mm -hmm. Like mm. I don't know if this has happened since the day of Pentecost. You know, it's just it's it's this new thing that God's doing, and the fact that sorry to go so long, uh -huh. but the fact that we live in a crazy time because from AD thirty three to AD seventy, those thirty seven years was the only period of time in history where you had Israel and the church on the earth at the same time. You know, because by AD 70, the temple's gone, the yep. Jews are getting kicked out. And so there was only 37 years of, you know, this, this book where you've got, oh, the church of Jesus Christ, and you've got the temple and Jewish, the Jews in the land of Israel. And they're there together. And that hasn't happened for 1900 years. You know, till really 1967, when the Six Day War, when the you know Jerusalem is is now called Jerusalem again, and here I am going, whoa, I'm living in a crazy time. Mm -hmm. I'm worshiping with Palestinians and Jews in Israel in Jerusalem, and. Is this the climax of all of human history? And I know a lot of people have thought this in the past. That's sure. why I'm being careful. I'm just going, wow, with the symmetry that I kept seeing wherever I went in Israel, like, look, here's what happened here. And then this happened in the same place. And this happened in the same place. It just felt very much like, oh, this weaves together so well. And here we are in the year 2022. Um, and from Adam to Abraham, that must have been crazy to wait all of that time, 2,000 years before mm -hmm. he promises Abraham. And then with Abraham's promise, it must have been crazy to wait 2,000 years until Christ. And here we are, Christ promises a return, mm -hmm. and it's been 2,000 wow. years. And with current events, it just seems at least yeah. interesting. And with Romans... <laughs> 11 talking yes. about all Israel will be saved and yes. at least one reasonable interpretation of that would be to take Israel to be the nation yes. of Israel so yeah. then that would that would mean that that would be at a time when Israel is is a nation yeah um, that's 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 certainly interesting I mean it's a beautiful vision I think you're yeah. I think you're right to say like let's you know be careful and not be overconfident in conclusions but there you know there's also this sense where I feel like a lot of us live kind of as if Jesus is not coming back. Yeah, totally. Right, and so part of what I love about what you're saying is, hey, let's continue to go back to, like, the biblical story and recognize, like, this could be tomorrow. It could, we could be mm -hmm. that we're in this season. Let's not be overconfident to, like, state that mm -hmm. definitively, but if that could be the case, like, let's be hopeful and, mm -hmm. and excited about that. And the other, I mean, even just going back to our, previous conversation I'm really challenged by the way the Messianic Jews that you were spending time with read scripture mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in part because you can only read scripture that way if you really value community and tradition over time 
right? Mm-hmm. Because it's just too rich for you to come up with yeah, on yeah, your yeah. own. Like you, yeah. you, could, you could not mm-hmm. go into your office, start from scratch, open your Bible, and come to the place of yeah. the things that they were, were sharing yeah. with you because they've actually lived in community yes. with the scriptures for so long. Yes. And one practice which has become significant for us even over just the last few years has been the public reading of scripture. Mm-hmm. And the way kind of the New Testament talks about devote yourselves to the public reading of scripture. And I think we often think of that as, well, that's because they didn't have Bibles in their hands, so they had mm-hmm. no choice. They had to publicly read the scriptures. But I think that there's more to it than that. Mm-hmm. One, because you're hearing it in community, and there's a richness about that. Mm-hmm. But secondly, because hearing the scriptures is often a good way to listen to long chunks of the scriptures mm-hmm. at one time. And you start to get this kind of overall arc of the biblical narrative rather than just, okay, what are the three verses that I'm, mm-hmm. that I'm sort of in today? And by the time you get two chapters you know, further along, six days later, you can't remember what was happening you know, mm-hmm. two days later. So I'm challenged by that way of, of reading scripture and mm-hmm. think there's real legitimacy to that. Yeah. I, I feel like I'm, in a way, I'm just repeating what you said, but I'm, I think even back to a point about rugged individualism and mm-hmm. the kind of instinct we can have as Gentiles to be like, that was the old thing. You know, yes. God killed the plant and started yes. another one versus uh, having a mindset of being like, no, we were grafted in yeah. <laughs> to yes. a very like, you know, intricate vision for salvation. Yes. Um, and this vine that God was growing for a long time. And, and, and that sense, you know, I think of like all creation groaning. There's a sense mm. of all of creation, like coming together mm. and, um, God is such an artist. Like he mm-hmm. does things so beautifully, you know, in the way that he weaves things. So um, exactly all of that, you know, symbolism, that renewal, that, the, yeah. you know, even the investment and in meaning in places um, and yeah. that I think that's something rich and beautiful about the way God writes a story yeah. mm-hmm. and brings it about. So um, mm-hmm. I don't, you know, honestly, I haven't, you know, I'm intrigued to okay. to, li- to hear what yeah. you know what he's saying. To hear more of the vision of um, you know why this timeline, why now? It, it's yeah. it's more that I'm I would I'm sort of open handed about yes, that. I would okay. say is that I don't think I have a kind of. Mm-hmm. But you don't see any red know. flags like when I. Well, no, because Jesus is coming back. I'm like, so, and I like you know, you... a question of, the question is always mm-hmm. the when, you yeah. know, and I, I think always I've, I've just had that nerves, even to that point of him saying, what I know is this small compared to how, yes, yes. you know, so I could see, I listen to you and think that would be a beautiful vision. And yeah. then I also think if it wasn't that, whatever God does will be a beautiful yeah. thing. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know, but yeah. you know, there's an openness to um, mm-hmm. But I do like that you mentioned that God's an artist, because in, in, in medieval times and early modern times, there's a lot more talk about, like, fittingness. Mm-hmm. Like, it would be fitting for God to do things in this sort of way, because mm-hmm. that would be the most beautiful way he could do it. And in centuries past, people took that as at least mm-hmm. some reason to think, mm-hmm. well, he might be likely to do it that way. Mm-hmm. Whereas I feel mm-hmm. like in our time, we just kind of think, like, very rationally, mm-hmm. and, and we don't think about, like, beauty or artistry as mm-hmm. relevant to how or when God might do things. So I, I think that there is something there to, to be mined from kind of earlier generations to say that God doesn't just do things in some sort of like cold, methodical, mm-hmm. rational way. He also does things in the most beautiful way because he is the supreme artist as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I, I think there's legitimacy in giving some mm-hmm. weight to that um, while also being open-handed about the mm-hmm. fact that whatever we can conceive, you know, going back to our previous conversation, mm-hmm. we think, well, this is the most beautiful way it could be, yeah, so yeah, it has yeah, to yeah. happen this no, time. Totally. Uh, no, wait, mm-hmm. because maybe we're not seeing something. God, is his ways are beyond ours. He may be able to see an even more beautiful way where there's even more symmetry and there's even more that yeah. could be woven together. So I, I think being in that place of saying, hey, let's be ready because uh, there's a lot of symmetry and weaving together here in a way that would be fitting yeah. Um, mm-hmm. And yet also having the humility to say, and yet I'm, I'm not in the place where I can say, this is the most beautiful way you can do it, God, yes. because he's got mm-hmm. resources that are yeah. pretty vast. Yeah. And they, to, I mean, to my mind, this is like a, just a perfect example of a conversation off the back of the last one we just had, uh-huh. because, you know, I'm listening to you and I'm, I'm sitting here thinking, gosh, like, like, I just haven't done anywhere near enough thinking mm. and reading and praying mm. and listening yeah. about this conversation. Yeah. You know, I've been more focused mm-hmm. on 
evangelism, tell people about Jesus, get them into yeah. he- you know yeah. into heaven, yeah. rather than yeah. like what's the t- you know. Yeah. But but if that's not a point of well because I haven't thought about it. That means mm. like yeah, it must be wrong. Right? You know, it's more yeah. like wow, like this is the body yeah. of Christ, like learning from each other, and totally. you know, wanting to go back to you, what does the scripture say? Yeah. And yeah. um and so I think you know this is like a good this is good that you're bringing this to the table to be like, how do we, as a Western church, are we even thinking about it? We were like, oh, well, we don't have anything to learn from Messianic Jews because, you know, we're we're Gentiles doing our own thing, you know? So um, I'm just sitting here thinking, I need to go away and do some thinking. (laughs) I mean, he was in tears when he was telling us about the kingdom. Like, he's just weeping. Like, how can anyone not think that... Christ doesn't want to come back mm. to where, you know, this mm, is yeah. his world, you know, yeah. and you just see his heart and everything, you know, I mean, brilliant guys, a Harvard grad lit major, you know, just everything has been the scripture. That's all he just has been consumed with these last 45 years. Yes. And, uh, but to see his heart and how much he loved it and, and he wasn't even making any prophetic, like, you know, it was just, it's actually one of his other guys that brought up the whole 6,000 thing. And I thought, mm. whoa. And my mind went to, you know, just because we had just had the Shabbat dinner mm-hmm. and the Sabbath, and, and, and I thought about Second uh, Peter 3, you know, where he says, do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years mm-hmm. and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish. That all, I, I mean, and, right. And, you, right? And you're thinking six days. Yeah, I know. Days. Six days. It's <laughs> almost like yeah. this hint, you know, because yeah. he's like, hey, don't overlook this one thing. Hint, hint, hint. <laughs> you know, beloved, that with the Lord, one day is as a thousand years. I'm like, gosh. And that whole chapter is about, I want to remind you of the predictions of the holy prophets, the commandment of our Lord Jesus through the apostles. And it says, knowing that, first of all, that scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing, following their own sinful desires. They'll say, where's the promise of his coming ever since the fathers, you know, he's gone, look, hey, you guys been waiting, you've been waiting, nothing's changed. And... But he uses the flood as an example. He goes, no, 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 you can't say ever since the beginning nothing's changed. When Noah said that that day was coming, it came and it changed the whole, you know, composition of the earth, you know. And he goes, and there's going to come another day. But, you know, we just have to be patient. And God is still reaching out to people. It goes with Romans 11 and that fulfilling of the time of the Gentiles. And then there's going to be some sort of revival, it seems, like in Israel, which <laughs> seems like it's happening right now, mm-hmm. okay? I mean, from what they're saying, a hundred years ago, they said they estimate less than a thousand Messianic Jews in the world, and now they're saying there's over 200,000. You know, you got 10 to 15,000 of them in, you know, the land of Israel, and something's happening. And here's this passage saying, you know, it's going to be like the days of Noah. Um, You know, or Jesus said that, but Mm -hmm. here he refers to the flood again. He says, it's going to, it's going to happen, but don't overlook this. Mm -hmm. You know, a day is like a thousand years, a thousand years like a day. I think, wow, that is, it, I know it stirred me up. Yes. It made me go, gosh, if this is the story um, it could be pretty soon. Yeah. And I mean, I can get it a little bit more detail. And again, this is all just interesting. I don't even know if I believe, sure. you know, but the Ayatollah Khomeini did say 2040 is the year that he says we will destroy them. And if you take 33 AD, okay, <laughs> as a time that Christ, I mean, you know, and there's debate about that. Sure. But add 2,000 years to that, that's 2,033, add seven years of tribulation to 2040. I go, wow, that yeah. fits nicely. And I'm not making it, I'm just <laughs> no, going, yeah. huh, that's, yeah. mm-hmm. could be, you know, but it just makes me think, gosh, why do I live like, 
I'm just worried about, you know, what yes. I'm going to eat tonight and yeah. whatever else when there's this story of human history unfolding yes. and I've never given thought to Israel. Yes. Mm. I rarely give thought to Israel. I didn't think about, wow, the Israelian church has only 37 years and now here we are again mm -hmm. with Israel and the church back on the earth together and it's at the 2,000 year mark of when Christ was here and there tends to be a flow every 2,000 years, something crazy happens, and now you've got 6,000 years of human history according to Scripture, and is it time for the Millennial Kingdom? Mm. It could be a good interpretation of this. Wow. Mm. Yeah, I had two other thoughts, which is one was, I was just imagining Jesus coming back and showing up at my door, mm. <laughs> and and wondering how I would react or, or even yeah, I guess he would he would come in such a majestic way but like almost like it would really take convincing for me to believe that mm -hmm. Jesus was at my door mm -hmm. you know I was just picturing it kind of like in the middle of the night I'd you know be opening the door I probably wouldn't even look up I'd probably be calling the cops or <laughs> thinking somebody was mm -hmm. you know there for a bad re like you know like would it even be on on my mind and my heart as like mm. in the realm of possibilities yes <laughs> right yeah like, mm. this could be what's happening you know do i even if somebody asked me the theological question i say yes i believe jesus is coming back and he could come back anytime mm. but in the reality of the situation actually is there a genuine kind of hopefulness and expectation of that that i would respond in such a way that would that would speak to that mm. that reality you know mm. and and i'm not sure so that's really that's that's challenging me. With yeah, because there. we should have a heart that's anticipating yes, that, right? He's looking for those that are waiting for his return. That's the word. Versus like, oh, he showed up and I'm like, is that really you? You know, because yes, exactly. there's something screwed up in us where we're not mm. anticipating this. Yeah, uh, Ellie was given in Israel a kit um, with the parable of the virgins that are have their oil lamps. Mm. And, you know, half of them have oil in their lamps and half of them don't and they're waiting for the bridegroom and it's like a teaching tool so she has this little thing sitting in her room right now but I'm thinking even just mm. hearing that she had it and then she opened it up in her room and we were looking at the little you know just very rudimentary clay mm -hmm. oil lamp that they used for centuries in Israel and filled them with oil there's an extra wick you know and I'm thinking wow I kind of want that as a prominent mm -hmm display yes. you know in our home so that mm -hmm. i'm mm -hmm. i'm thinking about that like yeah i want to be the faithful one who's got the oil i'm ready mm -hmm. you know i'm waiting for the bridegroom and he mm -hmm. gave it to her as a tool to teach and mm -hmm. have a moment mm -hmm. with other young people mm -hmm. like so beautiful thinking mm -hmm. yeah yeah because it seemed like they were waiting mm -hmm. like they're they're waiting mm -hmm. Yeah, they're yes. like the ones that have their lamp burning. Right. Yes, right. and that's why. They're I, but they're anxious. Yes, in a, the best way. It is, and it's. It was so nice to see that because yes. we don't see that here. Yeah. Yes. But there's also something I, they have an advantage of being on the land. Yes, I'm, yes. It's, not, it's just different. It's different. You know, when I'm standing on the Mount of Olives and imagining him coming back. You mm -hmm. know, mm -hmm. and again the poetry of standing up there and thinking about whoa. This is where Abraham offered Isaac. This is where he tied to Melchizedek. Mm -hmm. This is where David, you know, built his, you know, uh, his city, you know, his, his little uh, house. And, well, not little house, but, you know, is where he brought the ark. This is where the temple used to be. This is where the second temple was. This is where, you know, Herod destroyed everything. You know, like, it's just like all the history that happened in this place. And then, you know, they're going, you know, he's walking around the you know, the the government of Israel, like, this is going to be his government. He's going to come mm -hmm. here. You know, it's like there's something concrete. Yes. Whereas here sometimes we, totally. we can almost look at this, like, almost mythologically a little bit. Mm -hmm. yes. You know, with all the movies we watch, it's like Fairytopia or, <laughs> or Wakanda. <laughs> you know, so like... Having a lot of girls. Yes, I know. <laughs> a lot of girls. I brought in Black Panther, Wakanda. <laughs> you know, it's just like... You can start going, oh, yeah, yeah, Jesus, he did all these miracles, but, you know, mm -hmm. so did uh, Captain America or whoever. You know, it's, it just becomes, 
versus going there and standing there and going, no, this mm. happened. And I just walked through Hezekiah's tunnel. It's there. Yeah. You know, I just was in the city of David. And here's the Mount of Olives where he says, according to Zechariah 14, he's going to come back to this spot somewhere around here. Yeah. Like there was something about, we're waiting for this, that there are people yeah. there, there are watchmen, they're 24 7 are on that wall waiting for the return of Christ. Mm. Yeah, and it's like, wow. So Just cool. reading the New Testament recently, I kept noticing how it was like Jesus went up to the temple, then he went to the Mount of Olives, and he went, and we're, uh -huh. we're right there. Uh -huh. You see, uh -huh. there's the little valley in between, but you're up on the Mount of yes. Olives, mm -hmm. not far, just wow. a little mm -hmm. bit of a drive. But it's like he went up to the temple, he went back to the Mount of Olives, and yeah, just I don't know, seeing mm. being there, it really is significant. Wow. Mm. I was just wondering, maybe for a, a kind of further discussion, but. How do you think it should change the way mm. we live? Yeah. Um, like, is is it that if this is the season, mm -hmm. are there ways we should live differently now compared mm -hmm. to if we had existed two hundred, if we had lived two hundred years ago? Mm -hmm. Or is the fact that we're seeing that this could be the season mm -hmm. kind of calling us back to the way we always mm -hmm. should live mm -hmm. in light of the fragility of our lives on earth mm -hmm. and the fact that God and his sovereignty can decide to come whenever he yeah. chooses to come I, I, I'm asking that question really open handedly like mm -hmm. if if there's reason to believe this is a unique season in which mm -hmm. Jesus might come are there ways we should be living differently than if it yeah. weren't yeah well I think of like what Jesus said to Thomas like hey you believe because you got to see and touch you know, blessed are those who they're not gonna, they're not gonna see. And they're, I feel like just like he had that advantage, we have an advantage living in this day and age, because um, two hundred years ago there was, I don't, I don't know what to make of Israel. There is no such mm -hmm. place, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. Like we're, and so everyone kind of went to this replacement theology yeah. based upon the reality of well, it can't really mean it because there is no Israel. I mean, mm -hmm. you're talking about. Hundreds of years, 1900 years. And so how else are you going to interpret this? Well, now we're living in a time where there is an Israel, there is a Jerusalem, and there is worship of Christ there. We have an advantage. We can look back at history and go, gosh, this sure feels like all through this book, the Jews keep getting squashed and somehow God delivers them. Squashed, somehow God delivers them. Somehow they come back. And this was like the longest one where it's like, whoa. Yeah. To me, there's a sense of uh, some sort of apologetic there for our faith mm. that this is a modern day miracle mm. that we get to, we, in our life, in my lifetime, mm. I was born in 1967. So it's like, wow, I was born the same time. Jerusalem was, you know, again, you know, was born again. And it's just this whole idea of this is pretty cool. Mm -hmm. um, so <clears throat> not that, okay, so for 1900 years, they have an excuse to not be passionate about the return of Christ. Right. right. Um, I'm just saying, wow, we really don't have any excuses. Yeah. If we're really looking for it, yeah. he's really blessed us yeah. with a lot of, it's like a modern day miracle that everyone could look at. Mm -hmm. And I, I oh, I'm, oh, so many thoughts firing. <laughs> <laughs> um, but just one of the things going from my head is you know, that same framework that you were speaking about earlier in terms of, um, you know, am I open handed when yes. I come to these questions or do yes. I have vested interests? Yeah. Because what, what I'm thinking is regardless of whether, where you stand on like replacement theology yes. or, you know, a certain, yeah. um, belief about you know um, the restoration of Israel and mm -hmm. God's promises to them regardless of where you are as a mm -hmm. Christian on that question mm -hmm. I, I think what I'm thinking <laughs> is you know that's apply that same framework and criteria of, am I coming to the question with a vested interest because mm -hmm. you know, I think when I listening mm. to you and I, I'm just sitting here examining my own heart and, mm. and even the question of why haven't I spent more time? I spent a lot of time studying yeah. <laughs> scripture. You're right. It's a lot of time in the Old Testament. I love the yes. Old Testament. Everything you're saying about the coherence of it yes. is like, yes, ding, ding, yes, ding, yes, all yes, of that, hundred yes. percent. But then why haven't I spent so much time thinking about the promises to Israel today and yes. Israel today? And, and, you know, is there a part of me or, or any of us, yes. you know, that in our hearts it's because, 
you know, what are our motivations towards Israel? And I think about what you're saying about you know, even like you know, the work of Satan in terms mm-hmm. of like you look at the history of the Jewish people and just the horrendous oh. persecution. And, and I think about the, the uh, church's persecution of the yeah. Jews throughout history and how appalling yes. that was. Yes. I mean, the way like the Jews were treated in the Middle Ages by Christ. Yeah. I mean, it's so awful. I think about the way Luther spoke about them. You mm. know, like there's so much there in terms of our history Mm -hmm. and you know and we look and we want to say yeah but that was then this is now we don't think about it that Mm. way but i'm like well are there still seeds you know within even among those who aren't messianic jews Mm -hmm. you know who are gentiles who feel like well if those promises are there for israel does that in some way make me less special or does Mm -hmm. that you know i think is there a part Mm -hmm. of us that it has this vested interest in thinking like Mm -hmm. but you know is there any part of us like i don't want that promise to be Mm -hmm. true because does that Mm -hmm. mean that i'm like a grafted in person Mm -hmm. as opposed Mm -hmm. to like a you know the new inheritors Mm -hmm. that we're all you know is there a fear of a lack of yeah equality or a lack of god's yeah. love for us you yeah. know which it would be theologically wrong yes. you know to feel that way that you know god can god, yeah. god can reach people in different ways yes. and it's beautiful it's like you yes. have a biological child and an adopted child and it's beautiful both yeah. you know the you know and um, but i think i wonder if there's a part of us that feels like well it make me less special if that's yeah. you know mm-hmm. so mm-hmm. i i just i you know regardless of where you come to it's just a good question for your heart motives like do you yes. love Oh, do you love the Jewish people? Do you totally. love Israel? Is your heart for that nation? Is yes. your heart for, you know, like it should be for, you know, yeah. for yes. every person, but is yes. there a lesser desire yeah. for that is part of my mm-hmm. question. I want to talk oh. about that because, okay, first of all, I, I also understood more just the Palestinian conflict in the heart of the, I, we have a daughter who's Palestinian yes. and understanding, look, they've been in this land for yeah. 1900 years it's been their land yeah. you know yes you can go back and i do believe that but yeah. but there we need to be very careful and loving and that's what i loved about this group they're caring mm-hmm. for the palestinians mm-hmm. you know how can we help them yes. let's worship together we're one new man in christ yeah. everything is about salvation and what christ mm-hmm. did for us it's not we're not arguing about all this stuff you know and we're it's being ve- honest <laughs> yeah but they're saying you know when they talk about the feelings and the anger hatred all that stuff but um, to your point about the Jewishness of it all, I was sitting in the room feeling jealous mm. when they were talking mm. about this and, mm. and I was feeling it and going, gosh, that's so cool. I mean, not in like a bad way, just like, gosh, that's <laughs> so cool as they're teaching everything. And, and there was a part of me that was just feeling a little bit like an outsider. And then, uh, and I didn't say anything, but then someone started praying And it was like the Lord just Mm. lifted this veil of just, you know, Ephesians, where he says, you were alienated. You were alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ. So it was just this idea of, yeah, I was an outsider. I was I was alienated and the Lord was saying, don't you believe my scriptures that you're not outside of this. You're a hundred percent grafted in. Mm -hmm. You're rooted in this. You are one of them. A hundred percent. You are a, now you're not alienated anymore from the commonwealth of Israel. Like, and, and that's what they kept saying. No, you're our family. You know, Cause mm-hmm. I'm like, Oh, that's so cool. Wow, I, wish, <laughs> right. I wish we did, you know, Shabbat dinner. I wish we'd been doing the, you know, and it's just, it was just this amazing revelation. I felt of scriptures that were already in my head that God just at that time of prayer made me go, Oh my gosh, I am one of them. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Father Abraham. <laughs> you know, it's just that whole, it's like, At least oh, you should sing that, not you. Yes, exactly. <laughs> but it's, it was like, I, and I really believed it in that group. Like, mm-hmm. oh my gosh, I'm one of you. And they're like, that's what we've been trying to tell you. Right. Like, I believe it now. I get to inherit all of this. Yes. This is every bit mine. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't have to become Jewish first. Um, I inherit all of this in Christ. And I don't know, it's just a beautiful uh, thought, a beautiful promise. It's more than a thought. Absolutely. It's a reality that I'm a child of Abraham. And, and the truth is, is, you know, the Arabs are 
children of Abraham um, through Ishmael. And that's why they're saying, look, there was the promise. Just like, you know, when God promised uh, the blessing to Isaac, Abraham's like, no, you've got to bless Ishmael also. And explain, look, we have to have this heart, especially now after the time of Christ. We're in the pursuit of this one new man. And so it's beautiful to be in a land where you've got these warring, angry people, and yet there's a little circle here of... Jews and Arabs going, in Christ, I'm not going to leave you. I love you. You know, people were saying, I used to hate when I'd hear Hebrew spoken. Like, ugh. And now they're just going, no. It's beautiful to me now. And I can worship in Hebrew. And I love to worship in Hebrew. And, and then you had these Hebrew-speaking people that were learning Arabic just so that they could worship in Arabic. And, and you know... Mm. And we get to be a part of all of this wow. if we choose. So I, need, I need to take you guys there. Wow. It's just different. <laughs> we need to go. We need to plan the trip because mm -hmm. it is just, you've been studying this book your whole life. Really? And then to stand there, there it just does something. Mm. And then to be with these beautiful people that are worshiping him and just really believe this is a fulfillment of a promise. Mm. Mm, wow. <laughs> Actually, uh, to an answer to your earlier question, Vince, not that it's Please. really an answer, but you were saying, what are we supposed to do yeah. about this? And I'm just thinking of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, you know, where it's like that's kind of a a template for us. Like, we, those are all the things we want to be. We want to hunger and thirst for righteousness. Yes. You know, we want to be pure in heart. Yes. Mm -hmm. We want to be meek. You know, just read the sermon on the mountain. <laughs> mm -hmm. And when it's like, oh, what are we supposed to do? How are we supposed to live? Yes. Mm -hmm. Like, that's got to be the craving because that's mm -hmm. blessed. This is what Jesus said, yes. you know, mm -hmm. on mm -hmm. the place where he will return. He spent so much time there. Mm -hmm. And it's like, that's our, our answer. Hunger and thirst for righteousness. You do whatever mm -hmm. it takes, you know. Stop eating all the other things and mm -hmm. hunger and thirst for righteousness. You know, just going through each one of those with the Lord I feel like it could be such a, a rich, like template for, what sort of people ought we to be? Yeah. You know, that's mm -hmm. awesome. And that um, that's also a response to. So I was thinking like that same question could also apply to when people hear. Are you talking about, you know, what if it was in the next, you know, mm -hmm. however many handful of years? What if you're alive mm -hmm. when this happened and, um. Again, like regardless of your theology, whether you're more on the line of like, uh, like Jesus says, no one even knows the hour, so yeah, I don't want to yeah. overstep and say mm -hmm. too much. Or, you know, whether you're thinking, oh, this could, could be now. I think, yeah. um, again, it's that question of motive. Like, why is there a fear of, you know, like what, what you know, when you hear that, like, oh, what yeah. if it were in your lifetime? Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people will feel, feel fearful mm -hmm. of that. Mm -hmm. You know, that the reaction isn't one of like, like you're saying they're waiting, they're hungering, mm -hmm. they're like ready with mm -hmm. oil lamps. I think a lot of people that would freak them out. And I'm thinking in part, in part because they're thinking, oh, but I, I, there are still people I need to tell about Jesus. So mm -hmm. there's a kind of urgency motivation of like, well, get on with it. You know, mm -hmm. like don't waste time, like make the most of every opportunity. But also to your point, I think there's that, I think, I think a lot of us look forward to eternal life with God, but mm -hmm. we also feel entitled to having like this life mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. And there's also that uh, bit of a thing going on of like, but, but, I don't want to fully hand over submission now. Like I'll get there. Mm. Like at the end of the day, mm. like I'll repent on my deathbed or I'll, you know, um, God will make me fully sanctified in heaven. But if I hold some things back now, if I'm not fully surrendered now, I get to play a little bit of the, the queen or king of my own life now mm. rather than surrender. And so that seems really scary. The idea that Jesus mm. could show up and we're just like not ready, but mm. pressing into, you know, living that way mm. enables you to live with that freedom. I am, um, mm. I, I guess, just thinking about it a lot because of, the queen just dying. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, know, so I was just like oh, weeping yeah. watching I'm that. I've been so weirdly really? moved. Yes. It surprised me about how wow. much I've been moved watching, watching all the mourners go yes. in past her coffin. But I think it was because I was looking, I was just watching mm. the people go and mm -hmm. it was so diverse. Mm. And I just found myself crying. I think it was partly because you know, when do people ever in our culture come together and they're not divided, but all these different mm. people were like sharing in this like common thing. But I was also thinking about it because, um, 
I saw this guy who was reacting to, I mean, some of the, some of the things that are said about when Charles was made king, yeah. you know, and you kind of like swear to him as your liege lord and uh, like all the language is very um, kind of regal and ancient. Wow. You're thinking like, whoa, yeah. this doesn't seem very modern anymore. But yeah. um, there had been a comment by a guy who'd been interviewed by a journalist who basically said like, um, you know, where, when did we get to, when did we vote for this? You know, where was my vote? I didn't vote to make this guy my king. You know, that, that was the reaction. Yeah. I was like, well, I, I kind of take the point because, yeah. you know, he's a human person. So there's, today we're kind of thinking we're all equal. Like yeah. you don't put someone, you don't make yeah. them your king. Um, but I was thinking of the difference there is that there is going to be a, a king. Mm. Yes. Um, and so I was imagining these mourners mm. going past, but it not being like the queen there, but mm. actually mm. like when Jesus returns and what, what is the reaction like in that moment? And mm. um, and I was so challenged. I, I, people are wrongly ascribing it to Queen Elizabeth, but actually it was Queen Victoria who who once said, um, "I wish the Lord would come back in my lifetime." Mm. And so on, uh, she was mm. asked why, and and her response was, "So I could lay my crown at His feet." Oh. Mm. And I was like, that got me because I was like, "Oh, oh my God, That's is wild. that wow. my posture?" Like, am I like, I wish the Lord would come back mm. in this lifetime so I could lay my crown at his feet? Mm. Or am I like, don't come back yet because mm. I really like my little crown. <laughs> and it just, it got me in a big way. Like, where, where is mm. my heart in that? Did what you think that when you won Miss Teen California? <laughs> no, here, here he goes again. again. No, like at that moment, we are like, oh, I want him to return right now. <laughs> Like when I you're wish walking I would that have. Way. It was not that spiritual. That would have been such a good like victory <laughs> speech. <laughs> <laughs> mm. That would be. Wow. I wish you'd return right now. <laughs> <laughs> Next <right>. time. <laughs> good way to end this. Yeah, cut Francis's yeah. mic. Yeah. Cut <laughs> Francis's <laughs> mic. Oh. <laughs> Gladly do it now. <laughs> yeah, that is very powerful. Mm. I think most of us hope. Jesus comes back right after we die because we want our full life here on earth. Yeah. And that just shows how much we underestimate yes. who he is mm. and the eternity to come. Yeah. yeah.
Everything related to you make me smile. I know you are doing 